So I'm going to talk today around issues of diversity within the context of autism. Um, and I'm going to talk about sort of two studies I've been involved in um, that present some unpublished research as well as some published research. But the different ways in which diversity sort of um, manifests in autism and the different ways we should sort of be thinking about it and considering it. So one is a unpublished study where we sort of surveyed um, Black families of autistic children. And the second is a published study where we surveyed autistic adults who identify as sexual or gender minorities. But all of this um, sort of shows, both studies really show that people are having different experiences um, as a result of these different forms of diversity that they are bringing to their life experiences and it's impacting their outcomes. And so it's really, to some degree, it's a, it's a presentation to give us some food for thought and things to think about as we, as we conduct autism research and as we think about these, these issues within our daily lives and, and, and in our practice. So you've likely all heard at this point the term intersectionality. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard it. And really at its simplest form, it just refers to how we all have multiple cultural identities that along the lines of race, class, or gender, or socioeconomic status. And those multiple cultural identities can intersect or interact in ways that can get that can confer advantage in some situations and disadvantage in others. And so within this context, um, having autism um, is considered a disability. So in some ways, issues of ableism can affect one's um, life experiences and can cause one to be marginalized and oppressed in some circumstances. And then you can add to that being an autistic person of color where issues of racism may come into play that may further marginalize or oppress autistic people who have both of those cultural identities. And so really thinking about how the intersection of those identities are affecting our life experiences or their life experiences. And so I think for a variety of reasons, some of which I'll get into on the next slide, we've begun to think more within the context of autism around what does it mean for autistic people to occupy multiple minoritizing identities? How does it affect their access to services, their life experiences, the actual outcomes they're able to achieve, the outcomes others envision for them or they are able to envision for themselves? And so, as I said, I'm going to talk about two studies around autism and racial ethnic identity, and then autism and being a part of the LGBTQIA spectrum as well. So we likely also know, you likely also know that we have, you know, really over a decade of research documenting a variety of disparities among racial and ethnic lines within the context of autism. So... We know that black children, even though we're seeing with um, children of color that we are identifying in general, identifying children of color more with autism, which is a wonderful thing. We see there's still ways in which disparity shows up. So we still see delayed uh, or misdiagnoses among black children. So the timing of diagnosis is still an issue. Um, they're also more likely to receive other diagnoses such as conduct disorder prior to getting or ADHD prior to getting um, a diagnosis of autism. And with Latin A families, we know the issues of unidentification, delayed diagnoses, resist because of cultural, in some cases, linguistic barriers for Spanish speaking Latin A families. And then we also see differences in access to services that are impacted by race, ethnicity. And you can add on to, to the socioeconomic status, right? So fewer and lower quality services, some cases. Certainly low income families who live in urban areas or low income families who live in rural areas are also more likely to experience service deserts where they're having to travel further to get access to services. There's fewer service providers um, of close in close proximity to where they reside. Um, issues around being able to find coordinated care in a medical home and some differences in post high school. And we also, 
are seeing some phenotypic differences. I think the big one that we continue to see with Black children, right, is for some reason, um, they are twice as likely to have a co-occurring intellectual disability, Black autistic children, a co-occurring intellectual disability than white autistic children. Even when within the context of that study by Constantino and team, where they ruled out factors like parent education, parent income, child gestational age at birth. So sort of other known factors known to be associated with child cognitive development in general, those factors were ruled out and we still see this disparity for black autistic children being twice as likely to have a co-occurring intellectual disability. And even some of the adult work that we're beginning to see using large administrative data sets are pointing to some different chronic and physical and mental health conditions showing up more in autistic um, people of color, adults of color, than white autistic um, individuals. And so we begin to ask questions around why that may be the case. Um, is it inferior quality to the services? Is it um, these issues around diagnosis? You know, what's driving the disparities that are showing up? And I would say consistently showing up in our research. And we, of course, that we did some work looking at who's currently represented um, in autism intervention research. And what we see is that for studies in which race, ethnicity of participants is reported, the vast majority, around 70% of participants are white and autistic. And so we then begin to question for whom we have an evidence base within the context of the behavioral intervention literature. So there's certainly more work we can do and there are ways we can do, we can be better. And there's certainly ways in which we need to further recognize multiple minoritizing identities that are, that are affecting autistic people, because even from this slide alone, we can see that it's affecting outcomes. And so this is just an example, and I expect you to, to read this full slide, but this was a study done by some folks at John, Johns Hopkins and, and the UC Davis Mind Institute, um, looking at sort of this idea of intersectionality. So they surveyed um, autistic, um, black, autist black autistic individuals in comparison to black non-autistic individuals. And, you know, probably not shocking, uh, black non-autistic individuals certainly talked about the impact of racism, but black autistic individuals talked about both the impact of racism and the fact that they face discrimination as a result of being autistic. So again, that intersectionality, occupying those multiple marginalized identities and how that's particular, that's potentially affecting their outcomes in life. So the, the unpublished work we did um, as part of a pilot study for an NIH grant was we partnered with the Color of Autism, which is a nonprofit um, organization in the US that serves um, families of color who have autistic children. Um, I think largely a number of black families are a part of this group, but they run really sort of parent um, online parent training and support groups nationwide, really. And so we did some surveys through some of the parent groups really to get the experiences, understand the experiences of Black caregivers of autistic children. And so you can see here sort of, this was a small study, 27 families, um, all had children um, nine years of, of age or younger at the time they completed the survey. Um, all the parents were, were Black who completed this. And so you can see a variety of education and income levels. What we were trying to understand within the context of this study was one, the parents' own um, discriminatory experiences and encounters. So we used the everyday discrimination scale, which is a measure of discrimination. And then to what degree was that related to or not related to their quality of life as caregivers? And what we found was that one, these families were experienced, were having discriminatory encounters. So the everyday discrimination scale ranges from one to six with six scores being, you know, um, lots of discriminatory encounters, discriminatory, facing discriminatory encounters essentially every day. Um, the mean score for these families was um, a mean of 4.09, which means that they were reporting they were having discriminatory encounters a few times per year. 
And then we can see their quality of life readings there sort of fell right in the middle of the scale, mean of 3.49, meaning that they were, they were self-reporting that their quality of life was neither poor nor good. So right in the middle to some degree. And likely as expected, there was a correlation between these things and the way we hypothesize. So the more discriminatory encounters families reported, the lower their self-reported quality of life. So this is important information and, and things for us to follow up on. What was driving this particular finding, there are four subscales of the World Health Quality of Life measure, um, was the environment subscale. And that's where they asked questions around financial resources, um, personal freedom, physical safety and security, healthcare, accessibility, and, and quality of life. And what we were trying to get at to some degree with this survey and what the, the larger um, grant would, will hopefully be focused on, looks like we have a good chance of getting it, um, is understanding what we know in the broader literature right, is racial stress and trauma affects one's mental health. And, and a racial trauma is really akin to um, or likened to post-traumatic stress disorder. And that has an impact on um, the parent's mental health. And then that affects their parenting practices and behaviors, right? Because if you are sort of dealing with PTSD, you're dealing with your own poor mental health, that's going to affect your how you parent, your ability to parent your child. And so that affects parent-child interactions, which then has downstream effects on child behavior and development. And so we're trying to understand, we know that from the broader literature, we're trying to understand that specifically within the context of autism. So the grant is sort of looking at these aspects of what is called racialized trauma, and how does that ultimately impact um, child outcomes and development? But again, thinking about um, the consideration of this intersectional lens, Black caregivers are having, they're self-reporting, they are experiencing racism and discrimination. So that's likely going to have an impact on them. And so we want to understand that. I will say that Grant is also focused on, importantly, thinking about aspects of cultural assets or strengths um, and cultural capital that these families are able to leverage to overcome discriminatory experiences. Um, because I, it's important to have a balance to the work that we're doing, not just thinking about issues of risk, but also thinking about issues of resilience and strength um, that these families are able to leverage. So a little bit of a dramatic shift here, a little bit to a published study we did. And this is trying to understand the intersection of autism and, as I said, sexual and, and gender diversity um, within, within and how that is impacting outcomes. So we were asking sort of two questions within the context of the study. One, to what extent do unmet healthcare needs and health status differ between autistic LGBTQ individuals and autistic straight cisgender individuals? And the second was what state policies, policies and demographic variables predict the unmet healthcare needs of the LGBTQ group? And so this was part of a national survey. There's a broader national survey that some of you may be aware of that was launched um, after the, um, the enactment of the Affordable um, Care Act. Um, and so this survey though is really was, the survey was launched to understand the impact the um, healthcare reform was having on people with disabilities. And so we, from that sample, we pulled data on individuals who identified as autistic. And within the context of the larger sample of 2000, there were 120 individuals who self-reported that they were autistic. 62 of those reported they were also um, sexual and gender minority. And then 58 um, were straight cisgender. And so, um, and the survey was on those 18 to 64 years of age. So you can see sort of the sample composition there to some degree, uh, mean age is, is approximately the same. You will note probably some gender differences um, in terms of more males within the cisgender group and fewer within the um, LGBTQ group there. So again, the first research question was comparing the two groups. So the, the healthcare experiences of those who are autistic and cisgender versus the healthcare experiences of those who are autistic and sexual or gender minorities. 
And so this is from the survey, sort of how these various variables were defined. So health status, just asking, you know, for how many days during the past 30 days was your physical health not good? And then also was your mental health not good? And then we also, they also self-reported the number of other diagnoses. We pulled that information that they reported that they were having. And then total unmet health care needs, we ended up sort of combining some, some various variables and created an overall total unmet health care needs variable. So in the past five months, have you been able to see a doctor, get your medication, see specialists, get preventative health care, get access to mental health care? And the, the report on those sort of made up this variable of unmet health care needs. And so what we were finding, again, you probably can guess, um, those autistic individuals who were also sexually or gender diverse reported having um, significantly more poor physical health days compared to um, autistic straight individuals. And the same for mental health, they had more, they were self-reported more um, poor mental health days compared to um, cisgender individuals. They also reported having more co-occurring diagnoses compared to the cisgender individuals. And that those differences in co-occurring diagnoses seem to be most driven by differences in mental health diagnoses. So they were reporting more co-occurring mental health issues than say, straight cisgender ind individuals. And again, this is largely a refre reflection, right, of broader society. We know in general, uh, that LGBTQ individuals experience all kinds of mental health issues, largely because of issues of discrimination and societal barriers to participation and acceptance. And so it's not surprising that we're also seeing these findings showing up when we look at these issues within the context of being autistic and a sexual and gender minority. But again, it points to they are having different experiences that we need to understand better because it's impacting their outcomes. Um, they also reported just in general having total um, more unmet healthcare needs. So again, that list of variables, they reported more of those things. And again, when we take a closer look, that was really driven by not being able to get access to the, the prescription medicines um, that they were uh, that they needed to get an unmet health care and unmet mental health care needs. Again, not surprising given that they're reporting more mental health issues. And the second question, just look at the LGBTQ group and sort of was trying to predict, looking at predictors of unmet health care needs. So what led to those unmet health care needs? These were the variables we were hoping to consider, race, ethnicity, income level, sort of did they live in a rural area, a urban area? And the other thing we looked at is state healthcare laws. So did these individuals live in a state in which their healthcare law specifically prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity or, or expression? And unfortunately, we couldn't look at race, ethnicity, or rural, urban um, geographic differences just because of the sample was too small to really factor in those variables. So we ended up looking at income and state health care law. And what we did find was that the number that in states uh, that, that specifically prohibited discrimination based on sexual um, um, orientation or gender um, expression that those individuals were less likely to have unmet health care needs. So state policies matter. We also though found that those who living below the federal poverty level were more likely to have their health care needs met. And maybe that's because they're able to get addition, um, additional access to social welfare services or other benefits in some way because they also live below the poverty line. And so it really brings us to these kinds of questions, right, of, what can we do about some of these issues, um, given that we are seeing that intersectionality is having an impact, whether one is a caregiver who's a racial ethnic minority or whether one is an autistic individual who is sexually or gender diverse in some way. And so, you know, we've been, I've been thinking about this, this quite a bit or in terms of where, what are the next steps? Where do we go with some of this? What do we think about? I think the, the very first step, right, is just an acknowledgement that autistic people have intersectional identities. 
and that there are strengths and challenges, advantages and disadvantages associated with those intersectional identities. And we need to better understand those. And so the second bullet point there is really just this question of, or thinking about that we need to be centering some of these research questions. We need to be more specifically asking and understanding some of these research questions because they are impacting outcomes and experiences. We shouldn't you know, just be controlling for race in our data analysis. We should be asking race-centered, race-forward questions as a result of these kinds of findings. But also the, the earlier slide that I showed around just the documented disparities that we consistently see over and over again in our work, we need to be unpacking that and understanding what's driving it. Um, we need to be more robustly examining and understanding the impact of discrimination, societal stigma on the outcomes of autistic individuals. We certainly, as I said, need to think about the other side of this because that's equally as important. What are cultural capitals? What are cultural strengths of these groups? How do these groups leverage those assets that they do have, that they do bring to the table to overcome um, the barriers and obstacles that they are facing in life? We also just need to diversify our field to have people ask these questions, right? We need more, um, certainly more researchers of color. We need more autistic researchers who are involved in helping to generate solutions to some of the issues that we're facing. And then the last thing is we, we likely from that policy slide around state healthcare laws having an impact, we likely know we're going to need some multi-level and system level kinds of interventions because a lot of the issues I talked about here, when you're talking about issues uh, of racism and, and discrimination, um, in ableism, they are operating at a systemic level. So we need sort of um, larger scale and different kinds of interventions to tackle some of these issues. And this is sort of a, an article I published that was that I was involved in and co-authored, really just talking about how we begin to, to better engage with socioeconomically and diverse communities and racially and ethnically diverse communities. Um, and really to move towards more community partner research to be able to get at some of these thorny issues, these very thorny, difficult issues that we need to start really grappling with um, in, in this space. So how do we overcome some of these issues? Certainly it starts with approaching some of this work from an aspect of cultural humility and understand that we as researchers don't have all the answers, don't have all the solutions um, to the challenges that various communities of color or various other communities are, are facing. And so really how do we be able build partnerships with those communities to begin to tackle some of these issues, but also listen to them, but also understand the solutions that these communities have already generated to come up with some of the challenges and barriers that they're facing. So how do we move towards this? And this is just one example of from Sarah Dababna's work, where she's been doing some of this work with, um, again, Black parents of autistic children, sort of her framework, um, well, SHARP framework, it's not her framework, but she used a SHARP framework within the context of her intervention research to sort of bridge, um, to sort of bridge the uh, the divide, if you will, between researchers and um, black caregivers of autistic children. So this particular community, and really, it's just a um, peer to peer navigator model, right? Where you're you're sort of supporting parents, um, black parents of autistic children who've gone through the service delivery process and gotten their children access to services. You're helping um, them support other parents who are now going through that process. But layered upon that, though, is thinking about the particular context of this community and how do you bring that into the intervention research you're doing, the community partner research you're trying to do. And so those are the things we kind of need to think about as we approach this research. And then I think the other piece, right, is we need to make sure that we are hearing from a variety of autistic voices. Um, you know, those who are minimally speaking or, or uh, non-speaking, in addition to those who are speaking, those who are 
cognitively abled as in addition to those who may have an intellectual disability and the same for um, autistic people of color. Um, this was an article pointing to this, the lack of black autistic adults who are, have been represented within the context of autism research. So making sure we're hearing from a broad variety of people as we do more of this community partnered work, as we're engaging more with stakeholders. And there's certainly a, a part of practice that we need to move forward as well, right? We need to think about how do we support and train advocates and activists for marginalized communities? I think almost everything within, within the disability space has occurred, all the progress has occurred because parents have gotten out and advocated for change at multiple levels. I mean, we need to make sure that we're training for the training of cadre of advocates and activists from marginalized communities as well, so they can carry this, this work forward, but also make sure that any progress isn't leaving them out, that they're included in that progress. And certainly, as I said, we need to continue to diversify the field, including in the practice space, including having more autistic practitioner, practitioners and including to, in addition to racially diverse practitioners. Uh, we certainly want to ensure we're using culturally responsive practices in our work. And uh, again, I want to keep stressing that we're starting from a place of assets and strengths when interacting with families and recognizing talents and abilities. And certainly part of this starts with understanding and recognizing our own challenges and biases. We all have them um, that we are bringing to the table. And also within our organizations, are we starting from a place of equity? Are we looking at how our practices are potentially differentially affecting children of color versus white children? Are we disaggregating data in a way to allow us to understand if inequities are um, showing up in our practice? And so these are just some ways that people have talked about how we can be more culturally responsive in general. So again, self-awareness of who we are and what we're bringing to the table that we're purposefully incorporating marginalized communities and voices, that we're making sure that whatever space we're asking those marginalized communities to show up in, that it's welcoming and supportive of them. As I said before, that we're using data to drive equity. So we're looking at the impact of what we're doing differentially across different groups. And that we're also continuing to incorporate family preferences and values um, from a cultural lens um, in an anti-bias lens within our work. And again, this is just one example. Uh, there are many other examples of culturally tailored interventions approaches. Approaches. This is some work led by Jamie Pearson, who's a associate professor at North Carolina State University, an intervention she developed to support um, Black family, Black and African American families to sort of advocate um, for services um, for their children. So it's a sort of a family empowerment um, intervention that she developed. So really, I just wanna thank you all and, and sort of acknowledge some people um, who have helped me engage in this work and then I'm continuing to do this work with. And with that, I will end the show and take some questions. Thank you for having me. Questions? I know this was a lot around Black and uh, also Latinx a little bit, L LGBTQT uh, plus. What about the Asian community? And that when I say that too, that's very broad. But you know, there's a lot of stigma around the these different types of communities. Is there more research? Any, anything you can share about that? I think you know part of your question is in so many ways we need better representation within the context of autism research. Correct. I'm not personally engaged in that work, but I do know some folks who are doing some work uh, on the Asian community. Um, and as you said, it's a, it's a very um, diverse group, uh, it's sort of heterogeneous group as, as most um, different racial groups are. And so, and you know, they have their own experiences that they're mm -hmm. having um, on regulatory um, related to immigrant status, some re related to linguistic issues, some related to issues of stigma. So there are people doing this work, but I, I think the, the bigger issue is there's so much, there's so many ways in which we need broader representation within the work that we're doing so we can better have answers to some of these questions. Hi, um, so 
I know there's a strong environmental component in terms of uh, environmental pollution as it relates to autism rates. Um, how important of a, of a part would you say um, environmental justice and taking into account pollution rates are to this multifaceted approach? And yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, obviously one of the things we know from environmental justice lens, right, if you live in low income neighborhoods, you're more likely to be exposed to environmental pollutants, right? And so then you add on to that. Um, and we know also within the context of the U.S. that racial ethnic minorities are more likely to live in low income segregated neighborhoods. And so you add on to that then disability. And so we're, I think those are the kinds of questions, though, that you're raising that we need to be asking, right? Um, so what degree are all of these things sort of commingling or intersecting in some way that's more broadly, in fact, affecting outcomes and life experiences? Because the idea here is we can't disentangle this, right? Poverty is a factor, um, race is a factor, ex exposure then to all kinds of adverse um, experiences then come into play. And really the, the broader and the broader with almost psychology literature, you know, they talk about this as sort of concentrated or compounded disadvantage because one disadvantage sort of um, leads to another disadvantage, which leads to another disadvantage. So if you're poor and a racial ethnic minority living in a racially segregated neighborhood, you're also more likely to attend a lower resource school. Like all of these things begin to compound disadvantage. So I think we need to be thinking about and doing research on the complexity that represents the complexity of people's lives, right? Not trying to parse things apart because that's not how people live. Okay, uh, let's move on. Thank you, Dr. Boyd, for your excellent talk.